A commitment to what has come to be known as the Middle East peace process has been a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy for decades, and yet significant efforts have yielded less than significant results. In his recent article, The False Religion of Middle East Peace, Wilson Center scholar Aaron Miller presented a sober reflection on that lack of progress. He recently spent three weeks in the region. We'll discover what he learned and if it's changed his mind about short and long-term prospects for peace. This week on Dialogue, Middle East Peace, Reality or Illusion? Hello again and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guest today is Aaron Miller. Aaron spent two decades at the U.S. Department of State as an advisor to six secretaries of state. He is now a Wilson Center public policy scholar focusing on Palestinian and Israeli politics and relations and negotiations in the Middle East. He's just returned from three weeks in the region. Aaron, welcome back and welcome to Dialogue. Pleasure, Jen. Uh, let me ask you about the religious overtone or the metaphors that you use in your article, the false religion of Middle East peace. You make this an article of faith for some. Uh, talk about that decision. Well, I, I'm compelled by the notion that uh, secular or even theological religion consists of convincing adherents or believers uh, as a consequence of core principles which appear to hang together and provide a compelling view of the world. And uh, all of this is, uh, of course, uh, an effort to um, uh, offer my own experience up uh, as emblematic of that religion. I, th I think for 20 years, Middle East peace was my religion. And I essentially uh, believe deeply in three articles of faith. I haven't abandoned them, but I'm attesting each of them to try to determine whether or not they're still consistent with the realities today. And you, since you do invoke the word false, even though you are a former true believer, uh, talk to us about what are the elements that no longer hold up to scrutiny well, for you. Well, I argue that there's a reverential logic chain of three elements. Number one, that um, Arab Israeli peace is a core, if not the core, American interest. Number two, negotiations can deliver that peace. And number three, America will play the most consequential role, critical role, in delivering it in, in the course of negotiations. There's truth to each of them, but if you elevate and take each of them to an extreme, which I would argue we've done when we haven't been thinking clearly, you end up failing. failing. And this piece is essentially not an abandonment of one religion in order to embrace another. Uh, if there's progress and if there's if reality suggests that uh, things are changing, then I'll course correct. But right now, I see a serious problem with, with each of these articles. And uh, again, the article was designed to make people think, because when America thinks before it acts, it actually raises the chance that um, we can actually succeed. And avoiding failure mm -hmm. is really my hidden agenda, if there is one. The, uh, the historical context of this, uh, how long has it been that these articles, these three articles of faith, uh, have been conventional wisdom? And at what point did we go to extremes in our belief in them? Well, I would argue ever since there's been a peace process, uh, which essentially is the period after the October 73 war, where then Sen Secretary of State uh, Kissinger and uh, President Nixon essentially delivered three disengagement agreements during an 18-month period and paved the way for what became the peace process and the centrality of the American role. We've succeeded three times in 40 years. Kissinger's disengagement diplomacy, Carter's Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, and uh, Bush 41, Jim Baker's efforts to put together, together Madrid. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had a success, a discreet, compelling success since 1991. So I would argue to you that even though the uh, Articles of Faith continued after 91, roughly for the last almost 20 years, the reality is the evidence on which the articles uh, were based had begun to change. And that's the real testament to religion, if in fact reality changes and yet believers continue to believe. That's the cautionary tale here, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. the, uh does this old thinking that this is the core issue for U.S. foreign policy, perhaps for the world affairs, this Arab-Israeli dispute, does, does that still hold or has that changed as well? Well, an important issue, the core issue, absolutely not. We're engaged in two costly and unpopular wars in which the standard for success is not can we win, but when can we leave. 
Uh, we've now dodged two bullets, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, December 25th of last year and several Mondays ago in Times Square in an effort to, prov to prevent a consequential terrorist attack uh, on the continental United States. And we're involved now in trying to contain Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. I would argue to you that these three issues um, are at least important, if not more important, in determining the status and fate of American power and influence than the pursuit of what I've come to call the much too promised land. There may be opportunities, but we have to be extremely careful because these circumstances for serious, a serious breakthrough right now don't exist. Some have argued that solving the Palestinian problem, for example, is a paradigm shifting undertaking. If you could do that, that creates momentum where a lot, a lot of things change, including in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, that the whole perception of what's possible can change. I think if you could do it and create a conflict ending agreement, and it's still a big if, it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you could do it, uh, arguably you might have, uh, have the kind of consequences and reverberations that, well, they would definitely attend to our, to our benefit. There's no question. Would they fix uh, the problem in Pakistan, the perfect storm that exists now in uh, Afghanistan? Would they stop the Iranians from actually crossing the nuclear threshold? Would they deny al-Qaeda and its contractors and affiliates uh, opportunities to strike the continental United States? No. The answer to all those questions is no. It would help American credibility. It would relieve a great source of instability. It would help our moderate Arab friends. It would clearly help the Israelis. It would help reduce the rage against the United States. I think it's important for all of those reasons. But the question is, can you do it? This notion of a peace process, is the assumption fair that it's a U.S.-run peace process and that the onus falls on the United States to be broker, mediator, whatever right. the role is? Well, since is. we're the repository of both the anger and the confidences of the core players, and since no one has the kinds of relationship, intimate relationships that we have with the Israelis and the Palestinians, after all, this isn't one hand clapping, the reality is yes. We need to be the core broker if there's to be something brokered. There are others who need to play supplementary and complementary roles, the Arabs, the Europeans, the Japanese. The process has become too large for us to do a lone ranger. But in terms of the actual negotiations, the U.S., if it's to be done, the U.S. at some point in the process will have to play the determinative role. Is there a lesson here, though, about the limits of external intervention into a, a squabble, or even the limits of superpower to exert its will? I mean, it sounds to me as if you feel all your decades of pursuing this, that you're at a point now where you realize those limits are great, and that we just can't do it poking people with a stick from a distance. I mean, to borrow the biblical metaphor, you can't make bricks without straw. The regional parties need to be impelled by a sense of pain and gain that, in fact, it is in their interest. They need to own it. Without that kind of ownership, there's very little a great power can do. And even with that ownership, conflicts driven by memory, sense of history, trauma, where existential identity and physical existence are the core drivers, very hard for great powers, mm -hmm. distant from the neighborhood, certainly impossible to impose and very difficult to broker. This notion of pain and gain and, and what it takes to get leaders to take risks, which is essentially what this would be, a risky endeavor for anybody who leads the process. Uh, are we talking about a, a sort of this chronic malaise and that without an acute stage, no one's going to act? Well, that would be, uh, you know, that would be a tragic and sad manifestation of it. But the reality is that all of the core breakthroughs have come in response to either pain, war insurgent, insurgency, and or gain. The prospects that pain creates motivators. Mm -hmm. Sadat attacks Israel on October 73 uh, in an effort to lay the basis for a political strategy. And he does it. So it's pain, the trauma of 73, plus the prospects of gain. And the reality is that's what happened in Madrid as well. Uh, Saddam invades Kuwait. Uh, George H.W. Bush says it will not stand. Uh, we fight a short uh, and successful war. The tectonic plates move in the region. The party's calculations are scrambled. And Bush and Baker are able to, for a brief moment, to create America's moment where the United States is literally seen as a dominant political and military power in the region. And that, by the way, is missing. It's the mystique We're not of, viewed that way anymore. In my judgment, having come back from Beirut, Damascus, and Jerusalem, no. We're viewed more as a gulliver tied up by tiny tribes whose interests very often are not our own, 
bogged down in wars we seem to be unable to win, and in diplomacy in which we are not able to have our way. And the reality is at 61, I've persuaded myself that the most compelling ideology in life, it's not nationalism, it's not democracy, it's not even capitalism, it's success. Because success generates power and success generates voters and constituents. Failure, failure generates the opposite. This lack of urgency uh, that exists currently, do you see any pockets of urgency bubbling up where uh, there could be a, a change in the game, uh, that someone steps forward as a leader, some circumstances continue to evolve or the trends continue in ways that create the urgency as you described in the invasion of Kuwait or something like that? Well, you see, urgency only works if you have leaders that are masters of their political houses and are prepared even if they don't intend it to be begin with to take advantage of the urgency. And that's the real problem right now. Um, December of 08, January of 09, Israel and Gaza created enormous pain, primarily for Palestinians. But the reality is that there were no leaders, no, no motivation, no project in which the Israelis, in this case Hamas, was interested in promoting that could have taken advantage of the trauma. So that's the real problem. Even if you have pain, you've got to have leadership who's prepared with some measure of vision, some measure of pragmatism to capitalize on it. It boils down to one basic question. Can a potentially American, a transformative American president, in this case Barack Obama, substitute for the absence of leadership and urgency and partnership that now exists in this region with his own? That's the core question. The odds of that happening are not great, they're not impossible. He needs luck, but he's also going to need considerable buy-in from the parties themselves. Is this, this notion of leadership as you describe it, is this something real or is this an illusion? Is this a romanticized version of a, a time gone by and will the modern world support this type of leadership? In other words, you know, leaders need followers. Right, interesting Things question. Things have changed. Interesting question. And we're all too conditioned to accept the reality that our lives, personal lives, political lives, and the lives of nations are essentially shaped by impersonal forces over which we have no control. But I can't help thinking to myself, if you took the years 1920 to 1950 in the West, you could actually make the argument that five human beings, five men, were responsible for most of the death, destruction, and misery, as well as the prospects for security and salvation. Five leaders. So the reality is, in Arab-Israeli peacemaking, when there have been breakthroughs, it has been a consequence of leaders who are masters of their constituencies, not prisoners of their politics. So yes, I think the empirical case can be made that leaders can actually lead. Well, that's, that's good news. It'll take some good news when we can get it. What about overview of your trip? Tell us about your three weeks in the region. Where did you visit? Who did you meet with? You know, Groucho Marx once said that, uh, who are you going to believe? He said, me or your lying eyes. And the reality is, there's only one way to get a sense of what's going on, and that is to, to be there, to go there. We were in Damascus, uh, Beirut, Jerusalem, Israel, Ramallah and in the West Bank, didn't go to Gaza. My impression is that um, nothing that I saw changed my fundamental conviction that this is a very difficult region, to some degree broken, angry, dysfunctional, um, which is constrained by the absence of leaders and by the cruel and unforgiving realities of domestic politics. I think that's the one overriding theme wherever I went. Beirut. Did, did the leaders you meet with acknowledge or agree with you on this leadership void dilemma? No. Well, of course They not. see themselves as great leaders. Who are well, great. not great leaders, but I, you know, we, we met with the president of Lebanon. We went to prime minister of Lebanon, the speaker of the Lebanese parliament, the leader of the Druze, the leader of the Christian opposition, Michel Aoun. Uh, in Damascus, we saw Mrs. Assad, which was actually quite interesting, a modern woman um, trying to create a certain measure of openness and accessibility in a state that hasn't quite made that transition. In Jerusalem, we saw the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, Salam Fayyad. We met with journalists, with politicians, three cabinet ministers. Um, again, my overriding impression is that people are waiting. They're waiting because there's an absence of leadership. They'd like to move into a different era, through a different transition, um, but they're constrained. And they're constrained, it seems to me, by one overriding reality, that politics out there is existential. We've had our fair share of assassinated presidents, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what these leaders do and don't do affect literally the security and the political identity of nations. And this current set of leaders 
uh, our politicians first, prospective statesmen later, in large part because of the existential complexities of what is required to take on an issue like Jerusalem. You have a Lebanese government, for example, that literally is facing the reality that Hezbollah is the most significant and most consequential Lebanese political party militia organization in Lebanon today. And the central government can't control its own borders, let alone create a political compact between the governed and those who govern that is w viewed widely as legitimate. Plus, they are surrounded by neighbors, including the Israelis and, in this case, the Syrians, the Iranians farther afield that shape Lebanese politics. So in many respects, they're stuck. And the truth is, it goes on with the Palestinians, the split between Gaza and the West Bank, uh, the Hamas leadership, the Abbas leadership, two different sets of security organizations, two different streams of funding, two different sets of patrons, government of Israel, a, a microcosm of the broader divisions that beset Israeli society on the issues of peace and the issue of security. So if I could boil it down, mm -hmm. it would be that. It would be the absence uh, of leaders who are prepared to act and who can sell their policies to a skeptical, nervous, and uncertain public. D did you hear or see anything that surprised you, or were you uh, disappointed to find out that it was just as you suspected? No, I think there's um, uh, a certain complacency and post-peace process realities that affect both the Israelis and the Palestinian community. I mean, Ramallah never looked better. We, were, we walked the Kasbah of Hebron, which five years ago would not have been possible because of the security situation, and wouldn't even have been possible in the 90s. Jericho, tremendous construction. Israel, cafes are full. Tel Aviv is a robust, dynamic city. I mean, Israelis seem to be, in particular, in a kind of post-peace process complacency. And on, Palest on the Palestinian side, things are still harsh. If you're a Palestinian living uh, in the West Bank and certainly in, Ga and certainly in Gaza, which is a separate issue and reality altogether, your lives uh, are going to be very negatively affected by the Israeli occupation and the constraints imposed on you. But even there, uh, things are better. So I, I don't see the urgency. It's a false calm, to be sure. And I didn't write this piece to convince people that um, bad things aren't coming. I wrote this piece to American, for American decision makers to, to basically say, above all, be careful. Think before you act. Because in this culture, we live in an inbox. Washington lives in an inbox. And the pressure to act in matters of peace and war without thinking through the logical consequences can be prohibitive and extremely dangerous and for a great power unbelievably costly. What, how would you rank the current uh, attention span of the United States in regards to the region? Uh, you went through a litany of other issues around the world, North Korea, two wars, uh, all of these various things. And then that didn't even begin to talk about the domestic issues that preoccupy Congress and the White House. Uh, how much focus is there on the problem now from this uh, perspective of the United States? I think there's an enormous amount of focus for one reason, that the organizing principle of a nation's foreign policy is to protect your homeland. If you can't protect your homeland, you don't need a foreign policy. And the reality for this administration is most of the threats that will descend on the continental United States will come out of a region that is angry, broken, dysfunctional, and conflict-ridden. So it has to pay attention, number one. Number two, we are in a situation we've never been before. We have hundreds of thousands of American forces deployed in two Muslim countries. That reality, and by the way, we are saber rattling uh, against a third. We're not saber rattling, but the realities of how to deal with Iran, how to prevent Iran from crossing the nuclear threshold uh, is a serious problem. So we're in an investment trap in this region, in my judgment. We can't fix it along the lines that we would like to, and we can't, we can't, can't walk, walk away. away. And that is a very bad situation for the great power to be in. Did you encounter any, uh, what I don't even know how to characterize it, new ideas or outside the box thinking? Was there anyone that you spoke with, uh, whether people in the streets, journalists, leaders, world leaders, that had some things to say that you thought, yeah, this is something different, this has possibilities? You know, uh, out-of-box ideas are out-of-box ideas because they 
uh, rare. <laughs> well, they're rare, they're unconventional. The question is, do they work? And I think everybody understands what needs to be done in order to fix the Israeli-Palestinian problem, uh, which can only be resolved through negotiations. But no one is prepared to pay the price of what would be required to consummate a successful negotiation. So no, I find people to some degree bereft of creative thinking, Not, and it's no criticism. It's just this is a deep-seated, potentially intractable conflict. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very wary about what I would call global solution, big bangs, let's fix it in a hurry, because I'm not sure that's possible. Do you see opportunities to do little things, incremental progress? Yeah, and I think that's where perhaps the brightest spot uh, emerges, which is a Palestinian prime minister who is interested in building institutions, who's frankly borrowed a page out of a, uh, an Israeli state building book as early as the 1940s, to create their own facts on the ground. Not in an effort to unilaterally declare a Palestinian state, but to create transparency, accountability, and literally, even though the, the Palestinians are under occupation, to build the institutions of self-government while they try to negotiate an end to that occupation. And that's a, that's a very difficult task, but it's practical, it's pragmatic, and you got a guy, Salam Fayyad, uh, formerly uh, working for the IMF, World Bank, Western educated, very much a Palestinian nationalist, who I think gets it. Now, whether or not that pragmatic effort um, will survive if the negotiations don't uh, on the core issues, Jerusalem borders, security, and refugees, that's the real question. I want to ask you about an, an article written by Peter, Peter Beinert. We talked about this, the article in the New York Review of Books, The Failure of the American Jewish Establishment. It's been causing some buzz. What's your assessment of Beinert's argument? You know, the argument is premised on the fact that uh, the American Jewish community is kind of in a crisis, that young American Jews are either uninterested, bored, or hostile to the narratives of the their, Zionism narrative, as we've their known, their is and dissolving. And in other words, that the two, he doesn't make this claim, but this is what this is what I think the essence of the argument is. The two narratives that have sustained the American Jewish community, five and a half million people, um, are both vicarious narratives. One is the Israeli narrative, which has gotten much more complex. And according to, to Peter Beinert, young American Jews don't buy it any longer. They want to question Israel's policies and or they're not interested. And second is the Holocaust narrative that once the memories and the survivors literally pass from the scene, that those two experiences, Israel and the Holocaust, will no longer be able to power the motivation of a Jewish community. I'm not, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know whether he's right. Um, I, re I really don't. And I think the problem is that most of the American Jewish community still has turned Israel into a survival issue. And American Jews uh, still care deeply about this place and what it means. But not necessarily younger American Jews, according to the Luntz uh, right. research that Beinert right. quotes. Although I'll tell you, every year I go to the APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Conference Convention. Some years I'm asked to speak, some years not. And what I see is a multi-generational uh, crowd. I'm not sure about this. I mean, it's a compelling argument. To some degree, I see it in my own kids. Um, but I'm not sure. It's interesting. Where I found it interesting is this notion that perhaps if you put yourself into a position of victimhood, of perpetual victimhood, you don't see how powerful you could be in the equation. You don't accept how much you could do because you represent the most successful country in the region. Well, I think, I think to some degree that's true. Large parts of the, Ameri of the American Jewish community. I have to distinguish the reality here from, from Israel there. and the United States. You know, I had this notion in my in my last book, The Much Too Promised Land, I call it the cosmic oive, which is the tendency of some American Jews, many actually, to elevate everything to a level of existential angst and crisis, which I, I think is not wise. Um, the Israelis have a different reality, and there are all kinds of different interpretations here. The notion that was probably true in the 70s, um, we fight the Arabs during the day and we win, and we fight the Nazis at night and we lose. Yeah. The notion of what that psychological contradiction of success and failure, um, victors or victims, suggests in the mind of a people, it's hard to measure. Israelis have rebelled since that time against the notion of Israelis as victims. I mean, the whole point of political Zionism was the creation of the new, of the Noah's home, of the new man, mm -hmm. freed from the um, dependency of European governments. But the notion that we live in a dangerous neighborhood 
is one that is deeply ingrained. Small powers, I don't care whether it's the Israelis or others, live on the knife's edge. And the mentality of the small power has to include a measure of, call it victimhood, minor minoritarian psychology, which does influence the way they look at the world. So when the Prime Minister of Israel says that he's not going to allow Ahmadinejad to do to the people of Israel in eight minutes what Hitler tried to do in eight years, does that resonate among young Israelis? Day after day after day, when you match the prospects of Iran possessing a weapon with the rhetoric of denial, Holocaust denial, and um, extermination of Israel as a modern state, whether or not it's victimhood or not, you get a reaction. Yeah. <laughs> and I hate to do this to you, but we only have about a minute and a half left. And I want to ask you, if the president called today and said, uh, Aaron, what do you recommend I do? What's your advice? Um, you can't walk away, Mr. President, but you really got to be, you have to be very careful. In July of 2000, next month, roughly 10 years ago, we recommended to Bill Clinton with great passion, great conviction, that he go to a Camp David summit. He did because he wanted to go. Um, and though it wasn't his fault, um, you ended up going up to the mountain, no agreement. And then for a decade, you literally descended into a valley of despair, ongoing conflict, and to this day, the Israeli-Palestinian relationship has not yet recovered from the previous decade of broken and bloody oh. confrontation. So, above all, diplomatic equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath, above all, Mr. President, be careful and do no harm. First, do no harm. Aaron Miller, thanks for joining us, sharing Pleasure, your insights. Uh, we want to, in addition to thank Aaron, let you know that we appreciate your comments and encourage you to share them with us. And you can do so by sending email to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. We look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, and until next week, for all of us here at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org. Next week on Dialogue. Here. And we think that way about management, but it's not true. Some guy invented it, and it's a technology, in a sense, for organizing people into productive capacities. It's a technology designed to get compliance. Mm -hmm. And for creative work, you don't want compliance, you want engagement. And the path to engagement is self-direction. People controlling their time, their who they work with, um, what they actually do, how they do it. And there's